I'd like now to introduce our first presenter who's sitting right beside you there. You may recognize Mark. I know he's spoken with you before. We are very fortunate to have him here today. Mark Greenberg is considered a pioneer in the whole area of social and emotional learning or educating the heart. And so he can give us a perspective on how far we have come, maybe on how far we have to go in teaching children awareness of themselves and awareness of others. He holds the Bennett Chair in Prevention Research in Penn State College of Health and Human Development and is the Director of the Prevention Research Center for the Promotion of Human Development. Mark. Your Holiness, it's my great blessing to have time to share with you today in this dialogue on educating the heart. And what we know on the scientific end of, of uh, educating children in ways that will make them more caring and compassionate. Uh, and through your own words and actions, you've truly demonstrated for all of us the true meaning of compassion. And if I can have the first slide, uh, I, I want to show a quote. Uh, the second slide, please. Uh, a quote uh, by yourself. Uh, even though our society does not emphasize this, the most important use of knowledge and education is to help to understand the importance of engaging in more wholesome actions and bringing about the discipline within our minds. The proper utilization of our intelligence and knowledge is to affect changes from within that develop a good heart. And I think all of us on the panel today will talk about our, uh, our work and others' work that's all intended to help move towards that goal that you've stated so well for all of us. And as I travel uh, many places and I meet so many people that have become uh, aware of their own emotional life and, and learn how to manage and cope with the experience of difficult emotions uh, and how to become more compassionate through the reading of your writings and understanding your life. Like many others, I have been inspired by your own life and work to try to develop programs to encourage the development of compassion and caring and kindness. And it's an honor to be here at the inauguration of the Dalai Lama Center for Peace and Education. It's such an important point that the center is developing as an inspiration, not only for Canada, but globally to focus humanity on how to celebrate the common desire of all people for peace and harmony. Now, my own work is concerned with the social-emotional life of children. And as was discussed this morning, unfortunately, many children in communities throughout the world grow up in conditions that don't encourage or celebrate harmony or peace. They experience community violence. Uh, schools that are overly focused on reading, writing, and math, and not on the whole child. Uh, communities that just aren't able to develop the true potential of children, their social and emotional potential, their spiritual potential, or their cognitive potential. And it's a, quite a large order to create just and caring schools. And a central task to create these just and caring schools is to understand the developmental processes of the children how a child develops that can help us to understand how best to educate the heart. Yes. And if I can have the next uh, slide, I want to draw one more quote uh, from Your Holiness. Uh, you told me at the Mind and Life Dialogue uh, in India in 2000. And as you said, it's better if one can prepare ahead with preventive systems. Once you already have experienced trauma, it's very difficult to correct it. So I always stress the importance of a proper education for, for the young child. This is something we can do. This is something that is doable. And there is substantial evidence that this is doable, that we can successfully teach children more effectively that we can teach children more effectively how to overcome and to manage emotions such as fear and hatred, anger and anxiety. Social and emotional learning programs uh, have proven this, that children can develop lifelong abilities such as self-awareness, 
anger management, impulse control, uh, empathy, and compassion. Now, on my visit with you in India, I, I discussed in detail how we went about uh, doing this in our own work, and I won't spend time on that today. But I'd like to talk about the scientific uh, evaluation of these kinds of programs. In our own work for the last uh, 26 years, we have been conducting randomized trials. In these trials, we randomize schools. All the schools agree, yes, we would like to try the program. And then half of them are randomized, and they get the program. The other half do not get the program. There's no other differences. We, we evaluate the children, both by their own reports, by teacher reports, by parent reports, before the program, after the program, and one year later, two years later, to see if the program really does make a difference in how children can manage themselves. And with careful randomized trials, we and other scientists have been able to show uh, that we can help children to become more emotionally aware. We can help them to increase their pro-social behavior, their kindness and their caring and their compassion. We can create safer and more uh, loving atmospheres in a classroom. And children's uh, both aggressive behavior and sadness and anxiety decrease substantially. This is very important. But in addition, we also find that by teaching children about their social and emotional life, it affects their thinking skills. They become more cognitively thinking skills. And I know you're very interested in the neuroscience of this, and uh, just like um, our colleague Richard Davidson, we've been trying to understand what happens in the brain at, at a very remote level. As, as we know, as children develop between the early childhood and the middle childhood, the frontal lobe develops very rapidly. And as you said this morning, uh, when the brain is flooded with anger or hatred, uh, it can't reason. Uh, and what the frontal lobe does as it develops maturely is it helps to regulate that emotion so that we can use our reasoning skills effectively for nonviolent means. Uh, if I could have the next slide. Uh, in, the, in the curriculum, we focus on children becoming consciously aware of their emotional states, both of themselves and others, how to put their feelings into words, how to calm down when they're highly aroused or, or upset, how to plan ahead and think about the consequences of their behavior, and how to develop greater empathy and compassion for others. In the randomized trials, when we do this, we find that it also affects their frontal lobe abilities. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you if I get the next slide. Uh, that uh, so one more slide forward, please. That um, a simple test, and this is a, a version of test called the Stroop test. And the Stroop test is a test of, of uh, uh, in the first slide I'm showing you of reading. So all we ask children to do, or adults, is to read the words they see, starting with red, and go red, orange, green, brown, pink. That's not too hard, it's just a reading test. And next we give them a second version. And as I give everyone the second version, what I want you to do is read the color of the word and not what the word says. This is difficult because we want to say red, don't we? But as our frontal lobe matures, the ability to inhibit our first impulse, our first behavior, uh, develops. And what we found is when children get a social-emotional learning curriculum, like the PASS curriculum, that not only do they change in their behavior, but they change in their ability to do a task like this. And their ability to do this task Their ability to do this task means they can stop and delay and not be caught up to have more control over their reasoning abilities. And that change explains why they go down in aggressive behavior and why they become low, lower in depression. 
this is a form of mindfulness, in a sense, in that, in that what we're doing in these curriculums is by helping children to control their arousal and put into words uh, the, their inner lives, they're able to gain control over their impulse, and as a result, improve in their thinking skills. Uh, And this is a very similar part of the brain to what Richie Davidson has found changes uh, when adults have uh, mindfulness training. Now, we can obtain these improvements, improving children's social behavior and decreasing their, their aggression and their sadness, uh, but only if we can effectively implement these programs. And this is where public policy becomes so important because it really requires sustained use of these programs by teachers who are well-trained and this requires that administrators and leaders in our communities, influential citizens and educators, that see educating the whole child as the most important goal of education. For such programs to really work, it requires we provide children with significant and regular exposure to adults who effectively model these skills of how to recognize their emotions, how to calm down when they're upset. It's the everyday things of life, really. It's, there's nothing special here. It's, uh, as you said this morning, it's the simple everyday interactions we have that, that, that develop our abilities. But to do so requires innovation in the education of teachers. Teachers almost never uh, are, are required or receive in their training education in, in, in the topic we've talked about today in social and emotional learning. And as a result, we have a system in which teachers are very interested in developing warm and caring relationships and developing children's skills, but often don't receive the required training in their uh, early years of, of being a teacher. Finally, research shows us that from infancy onward, parents who help their children deal with their emotions, that uh, help them manage their emotions, that model themselves how to manage hatred and anger and disappointment, have children who show more optical physiological regulation and, and better competence over time. So our challenge really now is, from a public policy standpoint, is to, is to move our society, move our culture, so that schools see that their mission is educating the whole child. And I'm continually meeting with teachers that are influenced by, by your work and teachings. Uh, we, have a, um, uh, we have a lesson in the past curriculum that's about forgiveness. A teacher from uh, England uh, talked to me recently after she had taught the lesson. She said she taught the lesson and uh, talks about why, what is forgiveness, uh, how difficult it is to forgive, uh, why it's sometimes a good thing to forgive, how it, uh, it, it decreases our own burden by forgiving. And at the end of the lesson, she thought nothing had happened. But over the next week, little by little, children begin to ask forgiveness from each other. And at one point, a few children in the class asked forgiveness from the teacher for their own misbehavior, for disturbing the teacher. So we don't know what the consequences are of having these kinds of dialogues. So we really don't know what the consequences are of having dialogues about compassion and forgiveness until we do them. And when we begin to open the life of the classroom to allow these, what we see is dramatic change. So thank you. We're going to move through the presentations and then if we have time for some questions back to you, Your Holiness, or if you have a response, we'll, we'll move through the presentations first.